Hi, Fred. Thank you so much for joining me. I know it's uh, early morning in the UK. It's evening here. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks, Catherine. Good to be with you and uh, looking forward to the grilling that I expect to get from you. <laughs> oh, not too much of a grilling, I hope. I wanted to start talking directly about this particular economic cycle. And I guess because it's been it's been a, a real twist and turn cycle because nobody would have expected that it would be a pandemic that would trigger the mid cycle slowdown. And then in terms of the recent hikes in interest rates, obviously that's affected property prices. The, the news that's come out in, in Australia over the last few days is that in some cities, it's been the biggest annual fall in property prices that we have on record. It's been a volatile cycle anyway, because Australia kind of, you know, obviously we had a lot of stimulus that was pumped into the economy that prevented us going into a downturn in 2008. So we, we had a bit of a wobble then, but really all the first home buyer grants and the infrastructure spending, as you would be aware, pushed land prices up sort of through to the, through to around, um, 2010, then we paused till around mid 2012, and then land prices boomed once again into 2017. And then there was another pause in 2018, and our markets actually came back quite far in 2018, um, 2018, 2019, um, sort of on a par with what we're seeing today, but at a slower rate. And then, of course, COVID hit, and, and after that bit of a wobble with COVID, we saw a humongous boom to a peak in um, the beginning of 2022. And now, once again we're getting this sharp pullback so if you were only to look at uh house price data you probably wouldn't be able to identify much of a 18 year cycle there somebody an economist that didn't have the background that that you have and, and obviously that i write about would look at that and say well you know it's a very volatile cycle what's happening in the uk and what's your take on things so far well the important point is that the land value cycle is is based on the structure of the system so that even if there are volatilities that were not anticipated providing the structure of the cycle isn't damaged it will continue to head towards its end so for example the pandemic actually accelerated house prices in the UK. Uh, the, the number of people who l quit London searching for homes with more space in the countryside, expecting to work from home, pushed up prices. Yes, they slowed up a bit in London as a consequence, but the overall effect was the, the pandemic pushed up mm. house prices, along with, of course, the money that the government uh, poured in to help people to stay afloat while their uh, businesses were shut down mm. uh, and now of course we have on top of mr putin's uh, intervention uh, a slowdown well the media is characterizing prices over here as coming down mm. what actually happening is that the rate of increase has slowed down but they haven't come down in the sense of an absolute negative drop. Uh, the rate of increase has gone down. OK, but those with medium value or, or higher houses are still receiving more in by way of an unearned capital gain per year than most people in Britain are actually having to go to work to earn. Mm. Uh, so the apparent slowdown or drop in prices is still generating handsome rewards for people who have above average house prices. Um, look, uh, a lot of people are worried that yes, things are out of kilter and those concerned uh, with the knowledge of the 18 year cycle are saying, doesn't this deflect it from its course? Well, my answer has to be no subject to two considerations one mr putin doesn't go nuclear in ukraine and secondly that the chinese don't invade taiwan mm. 
subject to those two qualifications, I fully expect that the house price peak will occur in 2026, give or take some months, uh, and the end of the cycle will be 2028. And uh, we already see right across the world from the UK through Spain, Italy and into China, which has had a severe uh, reckoning in its property market, governments intervening to bolster house prices and mm -hmm. to enable uh, particularly young people to buy their first homes. So the intervention of the kind that reinforces the property market has already begun mm -hmm. right across the world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, if you only take a six month or a three month or even a one year perspective, you might think that things are tough in mm -hmm. the housing market, except that um, it's all heading in the, in the prescribed direction, subject to those two conditions that I gave you. Mm. I think it's interesting what you said about the rate of growth is just slowing, particularly in the UK. I had a uh, email from a subscriber who talked to me about a property that a friend of his had purchased in England, actually in London. And he said, you know, it's something like 18 percent higher than it was just before the rate rises started. And he sent me the link to an article on Sky News, which was calling this, you know, horror crash scenario of, of rates are going up and they're saying that prices are lower now than they were five years ago or something. And he was saying, look, this just isn't what I'm seeing on the ground. And I think what is interesting about this is that we take the middle number of a bunch of sales and we say that middle number is dropping. We don't necessarily see it on the ground in individual house prices in these stages of the cycle because for example when when prices start to drop it's the top end that drops quite considerably initially so the very pricey properties can't don't have that buyer market they had a skinnier buyer market to begin with and the properties that are falling around where the general budget is for the um, area in question so where the median price is are holding up a little bit steadier. And, and that's certainly what we've seen in Australia. So although properties that are between that kind of 500 to 800,000 price range have obviously taken a hit because but the buying market has been shocked, they're cautious, they know that rate rises are, are, are going to continue happening. And so they're cautious with their budgets. But it's not a crash that, that the headlines are painting it. And add to that that unemployment is very low. I mean, it, it is in it is in England. There's a labour shortage, if if anything. I mean, that's right of what you're seeing in England. Is that correct? Yes, and also the United States. There's a there's a big structural adjustment uh, happening. Do, do you go back to the beginning of that answer that you were giving about um, unemployment. So I'd told I'd meant, done that little bit about how the medium price hides a lot of what's really happening on the ground and unemployment is very low it's very low in England and it's and it's low in Australia um, it's low in America the unemployment rate has come down in America so even though we're not seeing wage rises you know considerably I mean that, that's the case in England right with with unemployment it's pretty low at the moment and that's not what you would expect to see at the end of the 18 year cycle when there's a crash that's correct. But what we are seeing, and it's confusing economists who, who don't have a, uh, an effective long perspective, is that they can't interpret what's happening um, in terms other than conventional wisdom, which misleads them. So mm -hmm. that, for instance, they can't figure out that the labour market is undergoing a uh, unique shift which we we don't appreciate the significance of just yet because it's going to get take time but people's attitudes have have been amended so many people feel that they have the right to remain at home and work from home and not go into the office and they can actually tell their employer that they're not going to go in and governments seem to be willing to go along with this well that is a shift in attitude uh, and there's going to be some kind of a, an adjustment, a reckoning, hopefully one to everybody's advantage. But in the meantime, uh, economists are 
still analyzing this war on the basis of what the generals did in the last war, and they can't figure out the detail. Uh, but all of this is noise in relation to the property market. Um, some are winners and some are losers at the present time, but uh, I'm quite convinced that uh, prices will regain their momentum. And there's one other thing, Catherine, that we need to bear in mind. 2024 is an election year in America, the UK, other countries, and that will be the trigger for more money being poured in by governments if new governments are elected, they will want to be appearing to be constructive and uh, boosting the markets. So between 24 and 26, uh, it will be the final phase, the rocket uh, price rise era. Uh, everybody will think that and breathe a sigh of relief and feel that the worst is behind them. Mm -hmm. And that's when the cycle, uh, when house prices end, and we head into the period of consequences. Yeah, and of course, those times, they always come when no one's expecting it to come. I mean, if you like the rate rises that are happening in the economy, people are expecting that. So it's been priced into the market already. Um, but at that end point, it's never at a point where you expect there to be an economic crisis. It comes out of the blue, as it was, to people that don't study their history and don't understand the mechanics of this cycle but I just want to go back a little bit to what you were talking about with the work from home because this was a question that I had um, from a subscriber when I mentioned that I was uh, interviewing you today and he he said well you know I'd be interested to know how it has um, you know obviously with the work from home that's enabling people to live far further away from the capital cities. So whereas before, obviously, they had to live within um, commuting distance to work, now in some circumstances, they don't need to go into the office at all, or they've got this hybrid model going on. And that disperses the land rent, doesn't it? Because a little bit like when the automobile came in after um, World War II, and you saw this you know, movement outwards, that's happening now on quite a great scale. I mean, I know people that live overseas or, you know, live in, in countries that where, you know, the land is much cheaper than it is here and still work for Australian companies. How is that going to factor in to the cycle? That That's the question. Well, it won't affect the cycle. It redistributes the current uh, benefits at the present time. So some of the land value in London's residential market is being shifted to locations two, two hour train rides away from central London. But the overall uh, extraction of rent out of the economy is the same or higher. Uh, uh, so we see the same thing happening with retail. Uh, but of course, not related to pandemic, but to uh, the internet, online sales, uh, retail uh, premises within the traditional shopping centers have come down, but uh, it's boosted uh, land values in other locations, particularly uh, places where the online retailers are located and they need warehousing space. The value of that has gone up, which compensates to an extent the drop in uh, land location values in uh, uh, shopping malls in urban uh, areas. So uh, the, the total value, which is what really matters for the cycle, is continues to go up. Some of it is redistributed. Uh, and uh, the consequences of that are not all cheerful. Young people in small towns, two hour tri train rides away from London, who thought they might have been able to buy a home in their localities are suddenly finding that Londoners are buying up the properties that they would otherwise have bought. So I anyway, uh, always bear in mind that the consequences of price adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, so, but this won't affect the cycle. It just means that some of the numbers are redistributed in spatial terms. Um, uh, London is having to adjust to the decline. Uh, well, the weakening 
of the rate of increase. Uh, and um, in the fullness of time, we'll work out what this means. I suspect more people will, well, it's already begun in the UK, people are moving back to London. Uh, they've got over the effect of needing more space in uh, um, the, the rural districts and some are coming back. So now apartment rents are starting to go back up uh, where before they were appearing to come down. Uh, so we're in a period of adjustment. But the overall consequence is no difference, as far as I'm concerned anyway, for the 18 year periodicity, providing Putin does not go nuclear. Yes, yeah. And we have to keep that as the subject of war and the realization of what's happening geopolitically has to be front of mind, I think, at this particular stage of the cycle and, and it has its own cycle as well. So it's one thing that we have to be aware of and we have to look at. But I thought what was interesting about the shift in population from the work from home ideal is that it slightly shifted in Australia the con of the items that make land valuable. So for example, you know, if you're not so if you don't need to live next to the train station that gives you the train ride into the city, but you will prefer to be living by the coast. So the topographical features of the land are playing more of a part in making the location more valuable than maybe the other features that we previously saw, you know, that you had to be close to a train station or transport strips, or even, I guess, because the internet has had such a, you know, in this fast technological age as well, that that has an impact on people's spending and buying habits and their ability not, not to have to venture too far from home. Um, I'm, I'm sure that it would have been similar, you know, that you would have seen in the UK with things like coastal regions and regional regions sort of taking the gains that they perhaps haven't before. Yeah. It's quite remarkable and uh, does take in some use to... Um, I've got a friend who is a pilot with British Airways who lives uh, in a uh, fabulous uh, castle in France. And he commutes to Heathrow. Mm. His point is it's as easy to commute from the middle of France to Heathrow as it is uh, to get down there from the Midlands in uh, England. Uh, so now people are taking this cross territorial border perspective on living. Uh, and that's just one of the fundamental shifts in attitudes the consequences of which politicians have no understanding, no comprehension of the implications for policymaking. Um, and so uh, we're flying, fr from the political point of view, we're flying blind. They mm -hmm. don't have a model of how the economy works and how it might be affecting things if it's adjusted. Uh, and so it's, what happened last week is extrapolated into the future mm. as if that that trend is is relevant to understanding the dynamics of the modern economy which is shifting in in fundamental ways mm. there there are many economic myths that are preached from politicians that dis Distort people's thinking about how the economy works and and you know what to focus on. It's interesting that story about uh, your friend who's a um, air steward because my sister is an air stewardess and she does it exactly the same. She doesn't live overseas in England, but she lives quite a long way from Heathrow and commutes because it's much easier and much cheaper for her to do that than it than it is to actually live in the centre of London, which would just be completely unaffordable um, in her situation to do so. So it's a it's an interesting concept. That. But um, I guess what the the other question that I get is that, you know, we the the we know that assuming that there isn't war isn't anything that's going to interrupt the cycle as we approach the peak or what we would be expecting around the peak is the question I get all the time is well how far are property prices going to come down what do we do with our money when something like this hits because you know the stock market's going to go the property market's going to go 
where where do we run for safety your money in the bank isn't necessarily safe because then the deposits are uh, you know the banks are going to keep the deposits because they go under um you know the the government's going to try and um, they're going to hit the taxpayer to bail the economy out and so the the two questions i get is one is you know where where are we going to put our money and the next one is how far are house prices actually going to drop at that point um it's it's a difficult question to answer historically because it but in australia i'm talking Talking about because Australia, the cycles in Australia and the crashes at the end of the cycle, where they've they've perhaps been more geographically, um, in the most recent ones I'm talking about. So, for example, in the early 1990s, it affected Melbourne um, very badly. I mean, Melbourne's property prices. If I look at individual property prices and go back in the records and look what they were, um, what people purchased for in say 1989 which was around the peak of the market and what they then sold for in the mid 1990s those prices halved so it could be you know so from 800,000 and they were then then selling for 400,000 and we're talking around you know sort of 1994 1995 prices didn't swing upwards until the late 1990s but whereas in Brisbane and in the other states the market wasn't affected so badly the commercial market was completely obliterated at that time um, so it really affected commercial prices but it's a very difficult question to answer as to how it's going to affect property prices. So I'm interested in that take, but perhaps just the first item, you know, that I was, uh, you know, mentioning there in regard to, um, you know, the cycle, if you could ex extrapolate on those two things, that would be very interesting. You put um, your finger on the one it issue that's different this time at the end of this cycle. I've uh, written two books recently published called mm. Hashtag We Are Rent, where I offer a really bleak outlook on the consequence of the end of this current cycle. We're now no longer talking about individual national cycles. Since 1945, we've been on a single global 18 year cycle. But that in the early uh, cycles, that did not include China, but it does now. It didn't include Russia, but it does now. With the end of this cycle, which is a global cycle, uh the these the chaos that will reign means that unfortunately there is no place to hide there isn't there is no place to put your money uh and i take a really pessimistic view of what's going to happen when the economy crashes Take the case of 2008. It was still possible in 2008 for governments to come together and say, let's borrow a lot of money and pour it into the banks that are too big to fail and uh, impose the costs on the people with 10 year austerity. And we'll get past this and get reelected next time. This next time, however, people won't trust governments they won't trust the bond market they won't um trust equities they they will be all scrambling to get rid of property but a lot of the funds are locked into property that they can't sell quickly to raise cash uh so they can't liquidate funds to pay the people who want to get their cash back um the consequence of this, uh, Catherine, as I present it, is there are four existential crises in the world today. They are, are all apparently unrelated. In reality, they, in reality, they are. They're all rooted in the same cause. But in terms of people's views on the timing of the outcomes, they appear to be scattered. So. For instance, the environment crisis, we talk about uh, net zero in 2050. 
in terms of the migration crisis into Europe and North America, oh well, it's still at a low level uh, and so on. But mm. these four existential crises will be forced into a single convergence, in my view, mm. when governments find that they are ill-equipped to deal with the downturn, the banks will be, uh, uh, appear to be going belly up as they did in 2008, but the governments won't be any better able to respond as they did in 2009, 10. Um, and uh, communities will, as we already see, uh, continue to be flooded or burnt down Thailand, Australia, uh, the Western US, coastal communities in the UK, we already have identified those that are going to go underwater. Well, the policies that already exist to try and handle that will, will be ditched in the panic. So money and policies will be withdrawn from dealing with the eco crisis, which will accelerate that crisis. So mm -hmm. that's how the convergence will occur. So if you're asking me where should people put their money that they want to uh, get out of property quickly, the answer is that subject to how we approach 2026 and 2028, if we don't change the way we think about that future now and start making preparations to elevate people's hopes, to build resilience, it's a total disaster. Um, I, I hate using the word Armageddon, but because I don't believe in using biblical terms when you should be sticking to purely scientific analysis, because then you're in the realms of um, forecasting by looking at um, uh, well, the stars or whatever. Uh, but there's there's no, no way in the English language to characterize what I believe is going to happen, which is why shifting from the the uh, pure economics to try to get philosophical about the future, how to protect our earnings, how to protect the future of our children's children, uh, we need to be refocusing attention on mm. issues that come back to the land value. They're rooted in that. All these existential crises are located in their origins in the behavior that flows from the uh, accumulation of capital gains from land. We need to re-examine that and to see if we can't all be rich by some other means other than buying property. It's uh, interesting because I think it goes over the evolution, if you like, of your career, because I know that when you wrote The Power in the Land, the idea there was that if you could show people that the crisis could be timed, which is incredibly valuable piece of information, then perhaps they would want to put in place policies or they would want to look at what you were saying was the cause of that of those crises and mm. do something about it in order to prevent the next one happening and it was a you know the the thing is about this cycle is it's not it's it's got a such a lot of history behind it and obviously you've traced it back you know it, as, as far as you can in the UK it's been traced back in um, America as far as as possible I mean I've had a look at areas in Europe and and some areas where they've got these long-term housing indexes and managed to trace it back a similar length of time uh, but that's not actually what occurred is it it didn't matter that you presented the evidence that here's this cycle which was immensely valuable and economic traders that came across your work recognized that value and advantage from that understanding but the politicians did nothing about it and so I know that that's kind of why you've changed the way that you deliver the message 
in this. But do you, do you see it as like a blessing or a curse? The the discovery of the eighteen year cycle. Obviously, it's you know I think it is something that it is very interesting. But looking back, would you have done it that way? There, there was no other way to do it. <laughs> One has to look for the patterns that explain the system, how it operates, who wins and who loses. And the 18 year cycle is, is the single best tool for doing so. Um, but it's not sufficient. Uh, and that's why I've taken a systems wide approach and a evolutionary history uh, approach to my current thinking and have sought to explain the collapse of civilizations in the past in terms other than the land cycle. And there is no apparent uh, explanation for why sophisticated civilizations end up collapsing other than by looking at the land market and the way the uh, resources are shifted in favor of those assets that generate rent. Mm -hmm. So uh, in ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Western end of the Roman Empire, the collapses are all anchored in the trends in the land market and the behavior of people as a consequence of those trends. And they're identical in impact to what we're seeing in our civilization today, except that today our civilization is a global one. What happens in the UK will rebound on what happens in Australia, etc. Space is, uh, is transcended now. We are a global civilization. And so to understand uh, these big structural shifts in society, in history, in the direction of travel, one needs to have a clear view of what's happening with what we call the land market. And then we end up with despair when we look at the politicians. The politicians are utterly blind to these trends and their causes. Uh, an example, for instance, is the International Monetary Fund. Uh, last month, they published an article by three authors who said that the correct way to raise government revenue is the one that delivers equity and efficiency. Well, you would think that if the IMF knew how governments mm -hmm ought to raise revenue in an equitable way and in an efficient way, they would advocate it. They don't. They advocate the opposite. They call it broad-based taxes. Now, their broad-based taxes is a way of disguising what's actually happening on the ground among the people who need homes, who don't want to have their homes repossessed, and so on. So although the IMF is, is publishing the evidence for the kind of policy change that would be ideal, they continue to practice the opposite. So it's no wonder that uh, politicians who are elected for four or five years don't bother to take the long view. They, they just fall back on the conventional wisdom. That has now become one of the existential crises this ideological paralysis, as I call it. They are paralyzed, they, and, and we've seen the fiascos in, in the UK, haven't we? Five prime ministers in six years, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. So it's musical chairs. But in the meantime, the, the economy carries on for good or bad uh, as, as required by the structure the institutions and laws that are driving it in one particular direction. And it's in the direction, I'm afraid, where the person who asked you where should he or she put her money is going to find that there is nowhere safe to put your money. We're all in it, in the same boat, globally. There is no, you see, with previous civilizations, if 
ancient Egypt collapsed, okay, it's just confined to one territory. So a, a, a new civilization could sprout somewhere else. This time, if our current global civilization collapses in the way it's done in the past, where do we retreat to? Where's the safe territory? Where is not being flooded or suffering fires and uh, the rest of it? Uh, there is nowhere on earth. And yet we, 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 it's too premature to think of going off to another planet with Mr. Musk uh, seeking refuge in the, in the stars. Mm. So we've got <laughs> you, you, the work you're doing. It's a land question in itself, doesn't it? Going to the, to the planets or the moon. That's uh, right. The work you're doing in trying to alert people to the cycle is really important because at least it focuses attention on a timetable and raises, as it did with some people who communicated with you, the options of what to do. That's the kind of conversation we need to get going so that people can, can review their options and consider whether their political representatives are part of that conversation or not, and hopefully, to build resilience against what is coming down the road uh, by creating strategies to deal with the existential crises. Hmm. It's interesting that you say that because at Prosper Australia, and obviously at, at we're, I think we're the oldest Henry George Association globally um, from when we were set up, but the, the discussion at the moment is to produce a paper that looks specifically at the, uh, the Australian cycle and does a similar to what you try to do with power in the land and obviously subsequently to that, which is to, to, to alert politicians to the timing of it. I mean, I've had individual conversations with um, members of different treasury departments across the country. And those that listen to me and understand the cycle have then gone out and bought real estate. <laughs> to speculate on the cycle I, but it's interesting that when you sit down and explain to a politician about this and you get someone's ear and you get them as if into a friendly conversation and you can present the evidence the the difficulty then and and the particular person i'm thinking about it, it works in a treasury department is that our conversations are now offline if you like because it's not an easy conversation to take into government at that point, because once you understand the timing of the cycle, and that means that you have to understand what causes the cycle and land price inflation. And then once you've got a grasp of what causes it, you can't morally go against what would eliminate that cycle. So it's better to feign that kind of economic ignorance, which is what the politicians do. And they're only in power for so many years anyway. And they've come up, which we'll get onto in a moment, but they've come up through the mainstream universities where they've learned these economic myths about, you know, uh, different ideas about what causes the economy to boom and bust, which eliminates land and money and, and um, you know, land and the banks from the, the models. But in terms of getting politicians to do something about it, the most that they will do in Australia is just tinker at the edges of housing policy. Or we'll ban foreign investment, for example, which is a tiny proportion of the market. So it's, it's not gonna make much, it's not gonna affect the cycle or we'll tax vacant properties, which is really difficult to um, legislate anyway, because how do you prove whether someone's got a vacant property or not? <laughs> it's not easy to prove. I'm interested in your, your take on how you take that conversation further, or, or what in your experience has, has helped with that? Well, but that's the, the $64,000 question that we hadn't got an answer for, throughout the last 100 years. The only way we're going to make progress in people's awareness is by building uh, a national, it's got to be in a global conversation. There has to be the mobilization of people, not the politicians, mobilize them to the point at which then politicians take notice. 
the time and again, when I have sat down with members of parliament, they said, well, yes, Fred, this sounds a good idea. Show me the votes and I'll do something about it. So it's left to me to go and get the votes for the politician instead of the politician taking the initiative and doing something in the interests of his constituents. Well, so how do we build a, uh, a national conversation, which is all we're going to be able to do before 2026, because there's no time now to fundamentally alter the momentum that's go already underway. But if we can build the conversation so that people, instead of feeling despair, mm. have now got hope that they can visualize a future beyond 26, uh, that will be something valuable because it will enable the policymakers to uh, become a bit more realistic than they are today. Uh, what will cause this national or global conversation? I don't know, Catherine. I'm struggling. Uh, uh, I'm looking for new ways to present the thesis without uh, looking as though I'm becoming hysterical. It's really important mm. to remain calm because it's easy to dismiss someone. Oh, he's, he's a hysterical character. Don't bother to listen to him. Uh, so uh, that's, that is, in practical terms, the immediate challenge. How do we awaken people's sensibilities, their mor moral sensibilities, to the consequences of just keeping on going like we are today and just being concerned with getting out of the housing market and putting our money away safely until the next cycle begins? Because if I'm correct, if there is no next cycle after this next one, uh, when Rome fell, uh, it was a thousand years before something resembling civilization returned to Europe. We want to avoid something like a dark age. Well, at least if we've got the conversation going about what we need to do beyond the next, this current cycle, people will engage and that will inevitably affect the politicians who will want to participate. And we might get some sensible, uh, constructive, defensive action against what is now unavoidable. And we're up against a powerful force. And I think this is what you pointed out in the corruption of economics, because a lot of money has gone in over the uh, decades and, and centuries into not eliminating a cycle, but changing the way that economics is funded and changing the way that economics is taught and people are educated into not being able to see what we can see so clearly because we didn't start in that school of thought. We started in a different school of thought, which was, you know, I think the same for you as it was for me, which was Henry George's Progress and Poverty. And once you had that understanding and you saw clearly the land, the other pieces of the puzzle could be constructed around it. And therefore you had a, a model of the economy because unless people understand that part, and the examination that you did in that great book that you wrote, which I, I, everybody should read, and I'll put a link to it in the information that I send out with this video, which is the corruption of economics. And obviously, Mason Gaffney has now sadly um, did so much valuable work, didn't he? Just such amazing work on the, the economics of land. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, Mason Gaffney. Oh but the only way that the politicians are going to ever change policy is if the population understands that they are going to be far better off if we share the economic rents than the system that we have now, which is for me and from my side and what I see from subscribers and, and clients that I work with, which is a kind of inbuilt fear of how do we get as much money as possible? And that's focused on a lot of the time, property investment. Uh, I mean, even today. So I had this email you know, come from a subscriber who was saying to me, um, 
in this desperate worry of, you know, our interest rates going to keep going up. I've read this article in the paper that house prices are going to come down. And of course, he's invested his money into the property market because the fear that surrounds people from the time that they get to working age and continue and build a build of pressure through that period is how are we going to speculate with the money that we have in the economy that we have and and just kind of added on to that um before i let you kind of sort of launch in on on all of those points you know i think that the the confusion as well around the way economics is taught is that we're told that we live in capitalist economies and so people think to themselves, well, capitalists and the, and the way that we make money in a capitalist economy is to accumulate capital. But there's no real understanding of what capital is or the separation of capital from from land or rents. You know, what what is income? You know, the, is it the income that you earn or the income that you get from rent? So, you know, maybe you can give us like um, I'm interested for you to give a, a quick just if you can go over the the a little bit of the corruption of economics and then yeah the because the psychology of the public has to under has to understand that they're going to be better off out of the system that they're in financially better off out of it because if we can't sell that point then nothing essentially is going to change and unless there's war or as you say something along the lines of the fall of rome the cycle is going to continue because you know it, it may take on different forms as technology progresses and people move out of cities but it essentially the land is the locational value of land the locations where the money is are going to collect the profits from the economy yeah well you said earlier that um in the end uh we our mindset is framed in order to accommodate a particular view of how the economy works and we now use the concept of capitalism to denote that system uh at the basis of it is something that happens at the beginning of a civilization where things begin to go wrong, which is when people in privileged positions begin to extract some of the public revenue and privatize it for themselves. So in ancient Egypt, it was the priests in the temples who managed to grab what were the some of the rents that the people who toiled in the fields were pooling into the granaries for the, for, for expenditure on the common good. Uh, in uh, the, the Roman Empire, it was the nobility who, uh, in the circle of the emperor, managed to start taking, extracting the rents and uh, putting it into their pockets. So they diverted away from uh, the common good uh, the, the revenue that ought to have been spent for the welfare of everybody in a fair way, everybody who is willing to work, that is. And um, so in order to preserve that kind of behavior, it's necessary to cr create a culture around it, which people accept as normal. I now call it the culture of cheating because it is cheating it's taking away from working people what the working people produce to spend on public services and they use it for their private purposes so that's cheating so language is extremely important because we celebrate making big capital gains from a land deal we think we've somehow achieved something good well, we have for the for our personal benefit, of course, but the systemic consequences are disastrous because we are extracting the revenue which the IMF says is the equitable and efficient way to pay for public services, which then forces governments to intervene to draw the revenue from people's wages and from their profits, which then creates disasters it amends people's behavior it affects capital formation where people live how they work it displaces people on a continental scale 
the, the migration uh, issue, for example, is not just that people in South America want to go and live in uh, the land of milk and honey, uh, the land of freedom in America. They have been denied the right to remain in their home communities. That's what's propelling them northwards, what's forcing them to float on rubber dinghies across the channel into England uh, at the risk of their lives. All of these issues are rooted in the way we allow the income to be distributed in a way that is inconsistent with the way we think. We think we behave morally, fairly. We don't believe we are cheats. Uh, but the people who are the big winners have to persuade us that all is OK uh, and that we shouldn't think too deeply about these issues which is why we are, we are schooled into not thinking about the deep implications of land and rent and all natural resources that deliver um, rental income. An example of a, a modern tragedy is the uh, internet, social media, and the rents that we get or ought to be getting from the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, the Facebook uh, asset would be worth nothing or very little to the owner of Facebook, and the same with Amazon, if the rents that had to that are generated by those inventions were pooled into the public purse. Mm -hmm. But they're not, they're given to Elon Musk and the uh, few tech owners who are then become the richest people in the world mm -hmm. as a consequence of which one of the damaging side effects is children have limitless access to the internet which is now damaging their minds uh, and distorting relationships with their peers with their parents and having consequences that we barely begun to understand that's how things can go seriously wrong when we don't conform to the principles of doing the right thing. Now, if we reverted uh, to doing what uh, in existential terms would be the correct way to behave, which is simple, you pay for your, the benefits you receive and you don't give up the things that you earn. You keep what you earn, but you pay for what you get. That's the simple principle to which everybody would say, well, they subscribe to that. And in much of their life, they actually do subscribe to it. But when it comes to rent, it's a different kettle of fish. It's completely different. There, it's everybody's for himself to grab what is unearned income. As a result, we're all poorer for it. If we restored sanity into the way income is distributed, suddenly government would be our friend instead of the enemy that keeps raiding our wage packets. Uh, and lo and behold, we would start to live flourishing, richer lives. We would all be better off financially, mm -hmm. psychologically, spiritually, morally. It would be a completely different world, but not, not something that's not attainable. We'd have to work for it, but we would be working for it on a fair basis, not having the nobility ripping off the peasants, for example, as happened in the Roman Empire and in the early years of the modern civilization. So we would all be better off, but governments won't actually enter into a conversation and start compiling the statistics on that. So I've referred to this IMF article where they say, the revenue from uh, the rent of land is the fair and equitable way to pay, to pay for public services. What they don't uh, add is that under the existing system, the losses that we all collectively suffer, are mm. they run into the multi-billions. We, we, we are losing, every economy in the world is losing billions of dollars and pounds just because we operate the current 
uh, system of public finance. But if the governments would start to uh, calculate and publicize that information, people would, who are reasonable would turn around and say, well, that's ridiculous. Why are we doing it this way? So one of the things we need to introduce is what I call zero dead weight, not uh, 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 zero carbon emissions. Yes, we need that, but that's one of the uh, subcategories of zero dead weight. We have to eliminate the losses that we all endure as a result of the way governments are conducting business on our behalf, allegedly. If we can eliminate zero dead, if we can achieve zero dead weight, we will have reached the highlands where everybody is happy and prosperous and um, they've got secure homes where they can raise their families without worrying. Mm. And that vision is so important for people to be able to grasp the concept of because um, I mean, what you're talking about there is the fact that the tax system as we have it now robs people of unfairly, it taxes people, but that tax, in a sense, is robbery of their earned income. And through that robbery of their earned income, in under the guise of we're collecting revenue, it's actually it's, it's damaging the economy. It's reducing the revenue in the economy because it's causing these large productivity losses through deadweight taxation. Um, the, the problem, I think, you know, the, the thing that you picked up there with the, in regard to the internet and the, you know, the, on one thing, there's wonderful things about the internet in terms of how we can communicate and even me being able to interview you which just would not have been possible prior to, to the internet to have a conversation like this. But I think the, the one of the reasons that people just don't grasp the cycle is because they haven't done the historical analysis that you've done. Because in order to do that historical analysis, it's not just reading random articles that come up through a search engine and what it brings you and uh, the new AI um, things that are coming up with these chat uh, bots where you can ask them questions they they have limitations as to the information that they can provide just based on what they can scrape from the internet but often the gold is in the books that have been written through time on history and to and that show the lessons very clearly I mean it, it was interesting to me because I wrote an article recently on um, Roy Wenslick and uh, it, he's always been in my head I've never really um you, I feel like I've got the knowledge of him, but I never really looked on the internet to see what information there was on the internet about him. And I think out of everybody that studied the 18 year cycle through that period, you know, obviously there was um, Hoyt um, who then went on to move away from the cycle, became a land economist and worked, you know, with government policy. There were people like Clarence Long, who was the politician and economist who identified a 17 year um, cycle in construction and building activity. But there was Roy Wenslick who did this tremendous amount of research on the land cycle and was a valuer. And um, obviously in the 19, 1936, he wrote the coming boom in real estate and what to do about it, which was in the midst of the great depression and was so good at forecasting where land prices were going to go that the investment banks and the big banks followed him. Yet he's, he's, he hasn't got a Wikipedia page and to get hold of his work and his writings, you have to go to the library that holds them. There's no information. And so, you know, it, it's a bit like, you know, when we, before we bought Henry George the form, we said, well, he's kind of hidden from history. There are these people that are sort of hidden from history. And unless people are going to move away from the internet and actually go into the archives and look through this information, they're going to miss it. So if anything, the internet, internet does have a kind of dumbing down on the information that, that people gather. They can't discern what they're reading because the, of the confusion of not having that basis of understanding in the first place, which comes to the corruption of eco economics again. I mean, can you give us a synopsis of what happened in the universities at that time that, that you and Gaffney documented so well and in such detail. Did you ask me to tell you about it? 
Yeah, just like a, not because again, like not many people have read that book and it is such a valuable document. It's one of the most valuable books. There's no other book like it that's been written to explain okay. how we came from, from an understanding of land and, and to work where so we have. What, what happened was that Henry George published a book, Progress and Poverty in uh, 1879 which had an explosive impact on the public consciousness across the world. And Henry George got on this sailing boat and came to Australia and New Zealand. He didn't stick around uh, California and he ca even came to the UK. They locked him up in prison in Ireland. He, he managed to break through the public consciousness. For those who the nobility at that time mainly who were benefiting from the privatization of other people's earnings, the rents, they had to do something about it. And so they appointed professorships in leading universities in America in particular. And those professors started working to allegedly develop economics, but in doing so, they camouflaged the significance of rent so that rent almost disappeared. It became a subcategory of capital. Instead of being a unique uh, feature of the economy with its own characteristics, which works in completely opposite directions to capital defined as the tools that people make to help them in their jobs. No, it was now submerged uh, so the language was uh, reshaped, the kinetic power of words was channeled into reframing people's minds. Well, uh, there was uh, a big upheaval at the beginning of the 20th century where people did try to change the system in Australia, New Zealand, as well as the UK, in Denmark, even in the US. but. Uh, they were resisted. There was the First World War, which didn't help, uh, but the, the culture, or the culture of cheating, as I call it, had, had embedded itself so deeply in people's minds uh, and in the institutions and laws that they got away with it. Um, and that process of uh, redefining the language of economics continued through the 20th century into neoclassical economics and what's called the Washington Consensus, which was then foisted on countries like Russia when it came out of the Soviet Union in order to perpetuate the model of economics that enabled the privatization of other people's incomes, which necessitated the taxes on their earned incomes which therefore divided society, created an adversarial kind of politics. So instead of everybody working together to achieve common goals, now it's conflict of the kind we see in Washington today, led by Mr. Trump, the, one of the arch rent seekers. Uh, so we end up with a divided, a, a, a catastrophically divided society, us and them, instead of being unified, in common goals to enrich our lives in all possible ways. And uh, it was important that we, we track the way that language was remolded in order to embed the ideas of the nobility, uh, which worked because they, those ideas worked against the interests of the common people, but the common people had to be tamed into accepting uh, this antisocial behavior and reframing their mind was the, 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 the principal way of achieving it. And that is the challenge now. How do we, in a cathartic way, reframe our minds back to openness so that we can ask questions and give uh, rein to our moral sentiments our normal empathies, our sensitivities for other people, our wish to be able to achieve uh, a decent living, not just for our children, but for everybody's children in the community, rather than 
now, which is, oh, well, I'll buy my kid, kids a home uh, and the other kids, well, they'll just have to go off to Australia, won't they? Because uh, that they can buy a home in Australia, which they it's can't buy. <laughs> They're not going to buy. It's not that cheap to buy here. I have to go to that's the region. The used, that's the way it used to be. But we've yeah. reached a point now where there is no escape. There's nowhere to turn. There's no cheaper place to move to, to migrate to. And um, that's the disaster. Mm. Well, uh, Catherine, you somehow have straddled the task of being a professional that helps people to understand uh, the, the statistics and the trends in the in the marketplace today so that they can make their judgments based on the objective facts as they exist and entertaining the idea that maybe there is a better way of doing things and you're to be congratulated on straddling those two streams of activity and I'd like to personally thank you for doing so. Thank you Fred. Well the, the way that I see it is that that, that I, we can't do anything on the policy side until people understand it on the economic side and and the only way to get people to understand it on the economic side is to wave money in front of them. So if you teach people for example I mean there's there's a lot of people that will lose money on property. So if I teach people how they can make money on property through understanding the cycle, and then if they understand the cycle, like I said earlier, they've got to understand what produces a cycle, why is there a cycle, and, and then how can we eliminate the cycle? Because each of the governments in um, Australia, you know, they have different policies that are going to affect the land market. So for example, in New South Wales, they've just implemented a policy where they are going to shift from um, stamp duty to land tax. So first home buyers that are entering the market, they have a choice of either paying 40,000 plus stamp duty up front when they purchase a property or instead paying a modest land tax every year. So it's a way of kind of shifting that. Well, people want to know how is that going to affect the market? And as soon as we start talking about land tax, we get into the idea of, well, how does taxation affect the real estate market? And then we move away from this idea and the myths that are perpetuated that and somehow um, the things that affect the land market are population growth and the things that affect the land market are um, you know the the uh, where interest rates are going where we've had many periods in time where interest rates have gone up and house prices have gone up as well in fact normally in the second half of the cycle that's precisely what you see so once I've been able to do that with people then the conversation can shift to help me on the other side of the coin, which is, you know, how can we change policy? But I'm interested, Fred, in how you came across someone like Dame Vivian Westwood, who is a renegade fashion designer and had obviously in her life, what a colorful life she had had um, in England. I mean, part of the, you know, an icon in England. How do you come across someone like that and convince them so solidly of the arguments that you're putting forth, so much so that her last campaign was called One World Rent. What, what happens there? What was, tell us about, tell us that story. She is a friend of Vanessa Redgrave. Uh, Vanessa Redgrave and her son Carlo Nero made a documentary that um, was based on what I I had provided them with. We went to Bosnia and uh, did a film there. And uh, in showing it in London, she invited some of her friends, including Vivian. And that's when Vivian learned, heard about rent and she got hooked. And so periodically I would get a question over the internet. What about this and what about that? Uh, how do you explain this? And don't send me a book, just tell me in simple <laughs> terms. And so <laughs> I uh, started sending her briefing notes and uh, she then came to realize that it's one thing to mobilize people to protest, but it was another to restructure the system so that collective behavior was changed. And we, we see the failure of not understanding that today with the Extinction Rebellion in, in Britain. Up till a week or so ago, they were climbing bridges and, and gluing themselves to motorways to
to create havoc, thinking that they could get the government to do something about um, the climate crisis. They now have said they've made no impact on government by doing those sorts of things. So they're going to now organize a big march. But what's the point of a big march? Governments can just ignore that. It's today's news, tomorrow is another day. But Vivian understood that in addition to being uh, demonstrative publicly, you had to have the, pol the one policy that really would affect people's behavior in the de desired direction. And so she bought into the rent thesis and yes, she called it one world rent. <laughs> And uh, she got me to do uh, the little speech at the end of one of her exhibitions on the catwalk saying, and next, in her next um, uh, fashion show, we will explain more detail about the One World Rent. Well, unfortunately, that didn't happen. We didn't put on that show. But nonetheless, uh, yeah, she got me to uh, uh, present one of her T-shirts, I think I wore, uh, yes. on, on the catwalk. But that was an example of someone concerned. And there are so many people in the world today, some of them very rich, who want to spend their money on doing the right thing for humanity, but they don't know what to do. But Vivian uh, turns out to have been one that did know what to do. Pity if she didn't get to know 20 years ago rather than very recently, because she's now no longer with us. However, her foundation is committed to the same objectives that she had. So maybe uh, this, uh, Vivian will continue with us uh, in spirit anyway. Amazing, I hope so, because I noticed in all the press coverage of her death, there was nothing that was mentioned about One World Rent, at least from what I could see. So I wrote no. a little piece and-, and, no. and It actually. was absent, but her family, are now running the foundation that she has set up that mm -hmm. launches this year and they will know that Vivian was the one world rent advocate and hopefully they will uh, participate in the campaign that needs to be run to just to get the conversation going among people of the kind that will lead to the structural changes that avoids the violence that occurs in the past when, when it's no longer possible to sustain social systems. We need to avoid those big uh, violent breaks. We need to do it in a smooth way so that everybody comes off better. And um, One World Rent is a concept that will help us. Yeah, and, and such an amazing advocate. It's, it's to, to have on board at least we did get some publicity out of that but we're, we're sort of coming to the end of the end of the time that I've got um with you so sort of before we finish everybody obviously is is very interested in the cycle and they are very interested in the timing of the cycle in your opinion just to reiterate we're going still you're still saying that we're going to have a peak going for a peak in 2026 or around that time before we head into a sharp downturn into 2028 and obviously the end of this decade. Nothing has changed in that from, from your opinion. I do believe that we are now on course to hit house price peaks globally in 2026. Governments across the world are taking action to reinforce the trend uh, they are not seeking to moderate it in any way uh, that sustains uh, stability in the residential property market. And so we will see that peak in prices, which will result in severe downturns because the, uh, people will lose all perspective on how a floor can be put to the decline in prices. And so uh, I do hope that thanks to your work and the work of others, uh, they begin to question everything associated with this cycle. Mm. The, the questioning about an early peak, of course, is coming from the rise in interest rates. I mean, I think people are, are saying, well, hang on a second, if they keep hiking up rates as they have, surely that would have to bring in an early peak, even if it doesn't bring in an early crash. Do you see anything, any reasoning around that from... Uh, 
interest rates will be starting to come down if they haven't already they will they will be moderated governments will have uh, an investment in stabilizing the existing system which means that interest rates have to be leveled off at levels that people can afford under the current conditions and uh, yes there are other pressures like um, uh, supply chains that, that are disrupting behavior but uh, all we've got to do is relearn what happened prior to the zero or negative interest rates when the 18 yes. year cycle operated uh, and we will see that there's nothing extraordinary about high interest rates and the boom bust cycle correct correct and and uh, yeah i mean that's very much about you know what we're seeing here as well i mean i think that there are some forecasts now that are coming out and saying well prices and you know, the price drop hasn't been so significant in some areas, but the prices are going to turn as we go into 2023 and markets will start to improve through that time. And, and I think that what, that's probably what we're going to see, in the, particularly in the latter half as we get towards the second half. And then, as you said, we will have then election campaigns. And of course, the, the thing behind this is that governments are not going to allow no government is going to allow house prices to drop significantly on their watch. They're not going to bring in the financial crisis. And so everything will be done to prevent that until we reach that breaking point where prices are, where, where it's inevitable because of the timing of the cycle. So, um, yes, thank you, Fred. It's so good to talk to you. I hope we can have another chat again. And I know just to finish off your writing, is it that you haven't published yet the third book in uh, We Are Rent? No, I haven't. Is that That'll be later this year. And um, I don't uh, pull my punches. I hope people read it and come to terms with the realities and engage in the conversation that we, we need to enter into so that we have hope in, instead of despair. That's what I'm aiming for. Yeah, well, your body of work has been tremendous and you've worked tirelessly for economic change. I think we all have a tremendous source of the theories and the ideals that Henry George, you know, it's captured with the world with so much excitement and kind of electrified the world with his own ideas and I really feel that you have done similarly in your work and your advocacy so we're all indebted to you I know you're thanking me but I just ride on the shoulders of of the research that you have done and have, have always been endlessly inspired by your work Fred so thank you so much and thank you for for uh, getting up and talking to us in the UK I hope it's not too cold there and um, yeah, wishing you, of course, a happy new year as well. Same to you and everybody in Oz. Bye. Bye. Bye, Fred. Thanks. Bye.